Center Foundation. And thank you for joining us for this week's huddle. The Stakeholders Health Huddle is facilitated by the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation as a way to share current information regarding the hospital's COVID-19 response. If you've logged into WebEx, please join the chat by emailing your questions or comments. Otherwise, you can send your questions via email to foundation at virginiahospitalcenter.com. And with time at the end, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Let's get started. Last week, we introduced you to our two uh, clinical leaders on campus. Uh, Ms. Melody Dickerson, Chief Nursing Officer of Virginia Hospital Center, and Dr. Jeff DeLisi. Uh, Melody, have you joined our call this afternoon? Well, maybe she'll join us in a few minutes, but we'll keep going. Dr. DeLisi, last week, the number of active COVID-19 cases in the Commonwealth had gone up slightly, but um, compared to last week, I should say this week, the cases went up slightly, but the pending cases actually went down. So do you see this as a sign that the initial wave of infected people um, has already happened, or do you, just, do you believe this might be a pause before a potential surge? Thanks, Tony, and, and thanks to everyone on the line for taking some time out of your day to uh, hear um, hopefully some important updates on what's going on here at Virginia Hospital Center. So when we last spoke to you last um, Friday afternoon, we thought we were potentially seeing a little bit of a leveling off of the number of infections uh, at uh, Virginia Hospital Center and hopefully in our community. Unfortunately, over the last week, we have continued to see some increases in the number of patients coming into our ER and the number of patients being admitted every day with, with COVID-19. Now, as Tony alluded to last week when we talked, we had a big pool of patients, we'll say they, we'll call them rule outs. We weren't sure whether they had it or not. We were waiting for tests to come back, uh, sometimes two or three days before we get that result back. What's really exciting, what I could share with you today in the last week, uh, is that we received um, the Abbott Rapid COVID-19 point of care uh, machine. And so we're now able to get results on patients um, in about 30 to 45 minutes from the time that they're swabbed to the time that that result is available. So it's really a remarkable turnaround time. And we now know the status of COVID for pretty much every patient that we need to in-house. We're really excited about it. What we have seen though is an uptick in the number of COVID-19 patients uh, in our, our hospital. Again, some of that from clearing out the rule outs. Uh, we actually right now have documented about three times the number of positive infections at our hospital than we did just a week ago. So we continue to see this, this number climb and uh, we're continuing to watch it real closely. I want everyone on the call to know that we are well prepared for the, uh, in the event that there's a surge. These are conversations we've been having um, ongoing for um, certainly the last month and, and even intensified over the last week as we've seen the numbers creep up a little bit more. Um, you know, as I said, this Abbott test really was able to give us a great, uh, a great advantage in sort of isolating the right patients, making sure that we get that result back and get them to the right, uh, the right floor. And then on top of that, the other thing that we're really excited about this week is that we received the doses of the study, study drug remdesivir. So remdesivir is a uh, promising um, uh, drug from a company called Gilead. They have a very large study going on. There's only about 150 sites worldwide. And we're one of them. So we're really excited to be able to offer that uh, potentially to patients that meet all the criteria. We'll likely be beginning to enroll patients uh, early next week uh, in that trial, but the study drug is here. We've been activated as a site. And again, something we're really proud of. I think it speaks to the nimbleness uh, of our organization and of our staff that we can get something together like this as quickly as we did. So we're, we're really excited about this. Um, Finally, I just want to thank all of you for all the efforts that you are uh, doing in terms of resp uh, helping us in our response to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. We can't do what we're doing without your support, and you've all been so generous uh, in not just uh, your financial support of us, but all the, um, 
I'll call it emotional support too. Our medical staff, our hospital staff are very aware of the signs, the posters, the banners that are around in our community. Uh, and it, it just puts a smile on all of our face when we drive into the garage and we see something like that every day. So thank you for all that you're doing. We'll continue to keep you updated. We'll see what happens in the next week. Again, we are, um, we're preparing, like there could be more patients. Um, the most important thing you can do is continue to isolate, continue to keep the, the six feet uh, distance between other people, stay indoors. Uh, and if we continue to do that, we do think that we can flatten, flatten the curve and, and, and kind of get past this and get back to normal. Well, thanks, Dr. DeLacy. Um, I, I just got a note. Um, our chief nurse executive, Melody Dickerson, is on the call. And I was going to ask our uh, Cisco web host if he could identify Melody and um, help us unmute her. And if Melody does get unmuted, um, she could just let us know she's unmuted because we'd love to engage her in the conversation. Um, so if Joe from Cisco can help us with that, that would be fantastic. Yes, um, I see Melody and she is unmuted from the, my perspective. Okay, well, thanks, Joe. Uh, Melody, if you can hear us and hopefully we can hear you, um, can you, can you give us a shout out? Let us know if we can hear you. Well, maybe not. But Melody's with us, and uh, I do want to thank Melody Dickerson. Um, well, on a day that she really could be um, spending time with their family, she is with us and still driving uh, excellence across this hospital system. So, Dr. DeLisi, um, COVID-19 is not obviously not the only thing going on at Virginia Hospital Center. We, you know, even though some services have been discontinued to for the safety of the patient and staff. There's other things going on here in the hospital. Can you speak to uh, the non-COVID-19 related activities? Yeah, so um, as I said, we have about 70 patients in our hospital right now that are positive for COVID-19, but we also have 300 total patients in our hospital. Which when you do the math means um, over two thirds of the patients in our hospital right now don't have COVID-19, they have other medical conditions um, we continue to have a very busy labor and delivery service. Um, we've got patients coming in for other reasons. Our surgeons are still taking out cancers. Um, our consultants are still coming in to help patients with other, other diseases. And as you might imagine, now that everybody's been sort of isolated for about a month, we're starting to see a little tick up in patients that um, maybe now require treatment. They've been home for the last, you know, again, uh, four weeks. They haven't really maybe gotten the same care they've normally had. So we're continuing to watch that real closely as well. In addition, our physician group has, to, has become, uh, I think, very proficient in using telemedicine and are performing a lot of visits every day um, through, tele, through video visits uh, with their patients. So there's, there's always a lot going on. We, uh, hospital, I always say, is a 24-7 business. It never stops, and, and that continues even in these uh, times of crisis. Thank you. Um, you know, as a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network, uh, Virginia Hospital Center is recognized nationally uh, for the quality of care and the patient experience. Um, how do we, you know, so we, we know that part is great, but how do we keep the spirits up of the people that are working? Because this is normally, this hospital usually has 95 to 99% occupancy rate. And so you just mentioned that in total, we have about 300 patients, which is, you know, far down from our, our, our normal census. So how do we keep everybody's spirits up and, and to focus on providing the best care we can? Well, what's amazing, so 300 actually, we're, we're, we're getting to be pretty full around our house, in, uh, around the hospital on the inpatient um, floors. Where we're not as busy as you might imagine is in our sort of surgical arena, our radiology department, physical therapy, some of our outpatient departments. Uh, and what's been really wonderful to see is the staff coming together to help out anywhere that they can um, so that we can continue to take great, safe care of our patients. Um, I've had some great chats with some of our OR nurses uh, at some of the various checkpoints. So we have, uh, we started temperature checks around the hospital uh, this week. So you, we look for a uh, temperature of less than 100.4. If it's 100.4 or more, uh, we're not permitting entry into the hospital. Uh, but we need, we need clinicians, we need other staff to help monitor all those entrances uh, so that we can do that safely and appropriately. So uh, we've been really fortunate to have staff just excited to help out. They want to be part of this. Um, and when you got a community like that, it really helps things to run as smoothly as, as they can. 
um, during a crisis. Thank you, Dr. Lisi. Um, this week, the CDC changed their guidelines. They're not recommending that, you know, we're wearing our masks. We've been, you talked about taking the temperature for everybody comes through the door. Well, we've been wearing masks now for several weeks, but the CDC's changed their guidelines. They're now recommending that everyone should wear a mask or some sort of face covering. Why, why the change in practice now? And what do you see as the benefits? So when you're wearing a surgical mask, um, it, it helps on a couple of fronts. One, um, it would help potentially block virus that is in the air. Um, and so if someone coughs, if someone sneezes, if there's virus particles in, you know, where you're at, uh, it provides some sort of blockage for that. The other really important reason I think for wearing a mask is it keeps you from touching your face. Um, when we think about why this virus spreads and how does it spread quickly. A lot of times it's you touch something that somebody else touched that, uh, who might be sick, and then you touch your face, you touch your mouth, you touch your nose. Um, we are, we're all humans and we tend to touch our face a lot. Um, and so I think one of the great elements of the mask is that it, it keeps you from doing that. But what's important to know is it's not enough. You got to use great uh, and regular hand hygiene. Um, when you put on a mask, you're supposed to do hand hygiene before you put it on. You're supposed to do it when you take it off. So hand hygiene and social isolation continue to be very important even while wearing a mask. Thank you. So while we've been presenting, uh, we've got a few questions that have come in. Great. So I wanted to go ahead and go to the questions. And you had mentioned um, taking precautions about temperatures and things. And so, and you mentioned that we're still delivering plenty of babies. And I guess that prompted one of the questions. So the question is, Dr. Delisi, should expectant mother take any special precautions if they're going to be coming to Virginia Hospital Center to have a baby? No, I mean, they would. The only special precautions are the precautions that we all should be taking. She should, again, be uh, quarantining, socially isolating herself, um, stay at home. But if you come into the hospital, uh, it's it's a safe environment and uh, all of our masks will be in, in all of our masks. All of our staff will be in masks because uh, that's what we're doing all the way you know, across the whole hospital. Um, but there's nothing special that needs to be done at this point in time. Excellent. Um, so. It seems like there was a lot of discussion around the shortages of PPEs and equipment. And one of the questions that came in um, is, does Virginia Hospital Center have enough ventilators here on campus, as well as what other supplies, medications um, are going to be required to uh, meet the needs of our patients that have COVID-19, as well as as other other illnesses. So one of the things that we do, we, we have twice daily meetings where we talk about um, a lot of different issues related to COVID-19, uh, but a special focus are, is on supplies uh, and medications. So um, we, we go through our supply list, we go through our medications, um, see what we have, what we don't have. We look at how many patients are on ventilators. Right now we only have, we have, we have 54 ventilators at the hospital. We're only using 14 of them right now. So we actually have a lot of capacity um, to increase the amount of patients on ventilators at the current moment. Um, in terms of other supplies, we feel pretty good about where we're at right now. I think we put um, very appropriate um, policies in place for PPE. We are preserving them. So we have people with the surgical mask I'm wearing. I've, I've worn it uh, a week. Um, you know, when I go out to meetings, when I'm in my office, I don't necessarily have to wear the mask. Um, but we have ways of storing them and our staff can store them if they're not um, in a patient room. Um, so, so there's ways you can preserve the PPE, make it last a little bit longer. And with some of those techniques, we, we feel really good about where we're at from a, a, a protective equipment standpoint. Finally, on the pharmaceutical standpoint, uh, again, uh, all of our areas that uh, procure supplies have been really aggressive about trying to get as much as we can um, so that we're confident with our supply. And, and I, I, th I feel really good about where we're at as well, um, you know, from a pharmaceutical perspective. So, uh, you know, we feel good where we're at right now, but having said that, we check it every day because we don't know what kind of surge we could have, what that would do to our utilization of various equipment or pharmaceuticals. And so um, as good as we feel today, we track it every day uh, to make sure that we still have that same confidence. And if we're afraid we're gonna run out of something in, you know, two weeks, three weeks, we really get, even more aggressive about trying to make sure that we can get uh, additional supplies. Thank you. So we had a question about the, uh, is that Melody? 
It is. Oh, you can hear me. Well, well, hey, Melody, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, so um, now that we've got our chief nurse executive on the line, uh, I, we had a question that came in. Um, really, our local committee really concerned about our nurses and our med techs that are on the front lines. Just you're in there every day. Can you tell, tell our folks that are participating in this call um, how they're doing, how the folks on the front line doing? Uh, thanks, Tony. I'm happy to, to uh, be heard. Uh, you guys have been doing a great job in my absence. Uh, the, uh, I think it has, this has been just such a moment of pride, I think, for all of us uh, to see this team of professionals come together. We have, um, I think the morale on the units is just so strong. It has been our ability to be flexible and agile and really get, um, you know, people who are maybe not as busy or their work areas have really slowed down and taking those resources so that we um, can support those people that are seeing these increase in number in patients. These patients are um, a much heavier assignment just, you know, because of all the, the personal protective equipment that they have to don and doff as they enter and exit these rooms to keep themselves and our patients safe. And, um, you know, the, the testing that Dr. DeLisi mentioned, the Abbott testing has, I mean, talk about perfect timing. If we had the number of positive patients and, and in addition to that, the number of rule out patients that we've seen in the prior weeks, it would really uh, be challenging right now. But, you know, morale on the floor is very good. The gifts from the community of food, um, we're, we're jokingly calling it the COVID-19 because we all think we're going to gain 19 pounds to this thing. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it has been so well received. The staff are completely feeling the love. And uh, I would just, you know, tell folks as this thing lingers on to, you know, just keep keep those gifts coming because, you know, resiliency is really something that, that we are very mindful of. And our behavioral health team has come up with a, a line that's especially for employees who might be challenging, uh, just, you know, concerned about their own safety or just, just tired in general and, and, you know, need someone that they have a safe space to talk to. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we see, again, that's just an example of the entire organization pulling together to get through this. Um, you know, the challenges in this week to come, it's funny, last week I was worried about ICU beds. This week I'm worried about med surge beds. Uh, but, you know, we have a plan in place no matter what happens. So, you know, I feel confident that um, that you know, our patients and our staff will be uh, well taken care of. Uh, thank you, Melody. Yeah, that you, you actually answered one of the questions that we had was around mental health. So one of the questions was about after on the back end of this, what, what are going to be the mental health needs of, the, of our frontline workers? What are the mental health needs going to be uh, of our community? Uh, with this extended isolation. Um, so um, it sounds like the frontline workers are being monitored and we're providing them access to mental health. But I guess the question is on the back end, um, what is Virginia Hospital Center going to be able to do uh, to meet the needs of the community writ large? So uh, that's a great question. And it's something that we immediately started thinking about as we knew that this um, you know, this pandemic was coming and uh, our uh, IT team was able to work with our uh, outpatient uh, behavioral health services so that we can continue to offer the same counseling and support uh, we did, you know, a month ago face to face. Um, so, you know, we we knew, well, I'll use alcoholic uh, um, therapy as an example. You know, obviously in a situation like this, that's this is a really hard if you are, you know, sitting at home and, you know, you have that time to, to really, you know, start thinking about how you might fill that time. Uh, so to be able to offer those, those counselings and those treatments to these individuals um, during this crisis has been a huge um, relief to, the, to that community. And we continue to take in new patients through that area. On the inpatient side, for the most part, it's business as usual. We are continuing to run our addiction treatment unit and our behavioral health inpatient unit. And, um, you know, those beds, the occupancy is is the same as it was a month ago. So, you know, that's an area just like, you know, women in it, but people, you know, continue to have these, we're continue to be there for them. Um, but for those outpatient areas where, you know, we, you know, 
due to social distancing constraints, we can no longer offer, uh, you know, group classes. We are figuring that out through technology. Well, thank you. Um, so the next question we had is, uh, I guess, Dr. Lisi, this will be one for you. Uh, we had somebody asking, uh, are there, um, what kind of side effects are there to the um, from deaths of your, um, from Gilead? What is, what do we know about that drug as far as side effects? Um, it's generally been well. So it, the, the study that's going on is what's deemed a, a phase three study. So it's really looking at efficacy. So there's already been phase one sort of safety studies done on it. Um, there are various labs that we need to, uh, to check on a patient that gets the study drug. I think the liver enzymes is one in particular that will be checked, um, but it's generally been well tolerated. Um, we'll see the works, right? There's no, there's no guarantee. That's why they're doing the study. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we'll be watching the patients very closely. When you do a study like this, there is just a, a ton of information that needs to be tracked for any patient that gets the study drug. And in fact, you know, going to my comments earlier about staff being really eager to help wherever they can, we've, we have two staff members whose job wasn't to be a, a study coordinator, uh, who now are spending pretty much all their time helping to find the right patients and will be filling out all the paperwork associated with the study. Uh, thank you. So um, I, this, this question, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with this, so i see if you've got any familiarity, either, either one of you. Um, so the question is, are there additional steps that the public can take to, to help fight the spread? Specifically, um, there's a new uh, organization, web-based effort called Stop COVID-19 Together. And I, evidently this is uh, coming out of UCLA um, uh, medical experts. It's an app and a web platform. I'm not, are either one of you familiar with that? Mm -mm. No, that's, uh, well, we've been stumped. First time we've been stumped, but yep. that's, that's a great question. And we'll, uh, we'll learn more about it. And maybe we'll have some more to share about it next week. But, um, we're, uh, we've got time for uh, one more question. And our last question of uh, this session is, if in fact there is a surge, um, our, how, how are we gonna deal with it um, here on this campus? Is it something that we'll take care of on this campus? Do we have the capacity with existing beds? Do we have to uh, build a field hospital out in the parking lot? You know, what would it look, what would the surge uh, capacity look like? So I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, the, um, so the um, Army Corps of Engineers, you know, I think all indications are uh, is that we will not experience or we hope we won't. I mean, you never know, right? Uh, we, we do not think that a surge like what we people have seen in New York is happening here. Um, and so our plan today is as we continue to fill up, is that, that there are departments that we are able to shift patients to one end of that department, build a wall, uh, and we're moving the medication dispensing cabinets and uh, getting the IT infrastructure set up so that we could add another 20 beds uh, to, um, to the inpatient side um, from an area that, um, that maybe isn't using all of their beds. Um, and so like women and infant, for instance, you know, uh, we obviously wouldn't want to put you know, mix those patient groups, but if we can create two completely separate units with two completely separate staff, and that's exactly um, some of the plans that we're doing today, where, um, you know, we've got uh, an, an extension planned if we needed it to it, literally double our ICU beds. Uh, we have additional 24 beds that we could take over from um, our general medicine floors and use that for our, um, our COVID ICU uh, if we needed to. Um, so right now, all our plans are to do things on campus. Uh, you know, we have talked about, do we, do we do a field hospital on campus? Those plans are ongoing. It is something that, you know, we literally have the designs written and, you know, day to day, we make a decision whether or not um, that's something that we need to do. Um, so, Jeff, do you have additional comments to add? No, I was, I was just going to say that it, it all depends on how big the surge is, right? Surge can mean a lot of things. So we've got plan A and plan B and plan C where we can put, you know, additional patients. Um, obviously, there's always a tipping point, right, where you can't literally fit anyone else in the hospital. And then what would you do? So we still think we got a lot of capacity before that would happen. And again, uh, all signs, uh, I would say at this point, don't necessarily point to an overwhelming surge, although we're watching things very closely 
is, uh, you know, you started the call out by saying we still have seen increasing numbers day to day. And, and you know, the other, um, I would say, uh, you know, friends of the community that we're, we're talking to and watching real closely are uh, our nursing homes and assisted uh, living facilities. Because um, obviously that is certainly a place where if there's some spread there, um, we could see a surge of patients from those facilities come into our hospital. And so how would we deal with that uh, is, is something that we're talking and thinking a lot about. Well, that's great. And, and I, you know, I know long term, that's one of the reasons why, why the um, executive team here and the board approved building an outpatient pavilion, which is um, right now being uh, continuing to the construction project continues to go on. Right now, it's a lot of site work, but there will be an outpatient pavilion that's going to be adjacent to, to um, the medical offices there at Building C. So um, a lot of this planning has been ongoing to, to meet not just uh, a surge associated with this type of health challenge, but, but just the overall growing health needs of the community. So Don't I want to forget the 4A as well. That will open in September. That's right. The, uh, the new beds in 4A. Beds. Thank you, Melody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're, 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 we're already um, well on our way to building more capacity. So um, we're about out of time. So I want to thank um, Melody Dickerson and uh, Dr. Jeff DeLisi, our chief uh, uh, medical and nurse executives here at Virginia Hospital Center. Um, this concludes our health huddle for today. Please join us next Friday at 1.30, uh, but also visit us on the web at www.bhcfoundation.com forward slash COVID-19, that's C-O-V-I-D-1-9, for more information and how you can help us. Uh, a recording of this huddle will be posted on the site in the next 24, hour, 24 hours as well. So until next week, be safe and stay healthy, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.